you have two potential solutions to a problem, solution A and solution B. In local tests, solution A performs extremely well, outperforming solution B, but as you deploy it out at massive scales, you find things grinding to a halt. Out of desperation, you deploy solution B, which works smoothly. What's going on here? And more importantly, how could you have seen this coming? Let's start with some examples. If you have an array of unsorted items, finding the index of an element means that you have to iterate through the entire list, checking every single one. Contrast that to if the array was sorted. So if the array was sorted, that means that you can use something like binary search. You pick the middle point, compare. If the value is above or below, you can discard half the list and then do the same on the remaining portion. Intuitively, without any sort of mathematical framework, you can kind of see that the first has to visit every single item in the array, in the absolute worst case where the item isn't in the array. While with the second, since you discard half the array after the first iteration, and each subsequent loop progressively discards half of the remaining, you only need to do a few steps. More formally, the first loop is big O of n, or order n, while the second is order log n. Let's understand what those mean. In mathematics, big O notation is a tool for helping us understand the growth of a function as x increases. Formally, it's defined like this, that is, if there exists a positive real number m and a real number x sub 0 such that the absolute value of f at x is less than or equal to m times g at x, for all x greater than or equal to x sub 0, blah 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 blah. Personally, a lot of this page just reads like a steaming pile of math notation, so let's look at some pictures instead. Pictures are always better. Here's a graph of f at x, so it'll just kind of do some crap here and then head up. And then let's add a second function here, call it g at x. So what that complicated definition is saying is that if there's some point on this graph where g at x times any constant is higher than f at x, and it stays higher after that, then f at x is order g at x. So if we backtrack, and here's f at x again, but this time, let's say that g at x is actually the function x squared. So you get this curve. Since f at x is less than x squared around this point, and after that it stays under there forever, so f at x is order x squared. Computing big O. So you have an equation, like you've got 2x, or 4x squared plus 7x plus 3, or x to the power 5 plus 100,000, it doesn't matter. Let's just work through a few of these. So what you want to do is select the dominant term. That means you focus on the fastest growing term, drop the constant, and ignore pretty much everything else. So f at x equals 2x is order x, since x was the dominant term. f at x equals 4x squared plus 7x plus 3 is order x squared. And f at x equals x squared plus 100,000, it's order x to the power 5. Here are some of the most common ones with examples of algorithms or code. So order one, that's constant time, so like an array or a hash table lookup. Order log n, that's log time or logarithmic time, and an easy example is binary search. Order n, that's linear time, so that would be something like finding in an unsorted array, and often radix sort, like sorting ints and floats is grouped in with this. There's order n log n, this has a bunch of different names. We'll go with quasi-linear. Anyway, this is comparison sorts, like merge sort. And there's order n squared, quadratic. Bubble sort comes to mind. Here's a bigger list if you want to go through them all. Can't say I've personally run into a lot of these, but they're interesting, so take a look. How this relates to performance. In computer science, when we're talking about the big O of an algorithm, we're more talking about something like either the time it takes to run or the memory it uses, given ever larger inputs. What we're in essence doing is looking at the time, or the number of steps an algorithm takes as the size of the input gets bigger. Going back to the first example, the unsorted array, you can see that as the array gets bigger, the time in the worst case to search the array also gets bigger. Linearly, in fact. If the array is 10 elements long, we might take 10 iterations of a loop to search the whole thing, in the worst case. But if the array is a million elements long, in the worst case, we'll loop 1 million times. 
so the growth was exactly proportional to the size of the array. Contrast that to binary search. If we start with a small array of elements, it takes just a few steps to converge to an answer in the worst case. And if we were to expand that to a million elements, because of the logarithmic nature of the algorithm, it doesn't take that many more steps to sort through, even though it's so much bigger. And of course, there's gotchas. In the strictest terms, big O describes the upper bound of an algorithm. It specifically says that your function f at x won't grow faster than m times g at x, for some m. But that also means that something that's order n, for example, is also order n squared. Because if it doesn't grow faster than order n, it definitely doesn't grow faster than n squared. And so on. So technically, if you're one of those people, you can just answer order n factorial or something like that anytime someone asks for the big O running time of an algorithm, and you'll probably be right. You won't like pass an interview or even be marginally useful as a coworker, but being technically correct is more important anyway. Here's another thing to note. In software engineering, we tend to use big O a bit differently. That is to describe roughly how fast we expect something to run. Like with quicksort, we often refer to it as order n log n. But that's kind of the average case, and it's often stated separately to have a worst case of order n squared. So we kind of play a bit fast and loose with the definitions and terminology of big O when something more like big theta might make more sense, so just keep that in mind. So how do I use this? It kind of gives you a sense of how something will scale, given larger and larger inputs. So if you're looking at two algorithms, like the unsorted search and the sorted binary search, you can kind of intuit that the unsorted search grows linearly and the other grows logarithmically. And you can conclude that the binary search version will outperform the first one. But there's some subtlety here. This gets me to my story and what was in the title. So a long, long time ago, I was interviewing at Google. Past the phone screen, and I was at the on-site making my way through the rounds with engineers. One of the interviewers was quizzing me on subjects near the end of our interview. At some point, we started talking about big O analysis, and I rambled a bunch on the subject, gave what I thought was a decent answer, and then stupidly decided to be smart and throw in some extra detail. Since big O is often describing the dominant term, and the others are dropped, when you're doing micro-optimizations, what's interesting is that those can actually be super important. For example, it's entirely possible for, say, an order n algorithm to outperform an order log n one on small inputs because of those constants that aren't reflected in big O. If you remember those graphs we looked at, big O defines the limiting behavior as the input gets huge. But at smaller values, it doesn't necessarily say anything. As you can guess, this was a bad idea. He interrupted me quickly, shutting down the idea, said I was just wrong on this. I remember being pretty nervous and thinking, okay, this guy's a Google engineer. I looked up to these people as super smart and figured I just explained totally wrong. So I gave the benefit of the doubt and replied that at huge scale like Google deals with, algorithmic complexity will trump everything. But what I'm talking about is game optimization and small inputs. It's entirely possible for those smaller terms to matter a lot. He cut me off again and said, that's not how it works. Order n is slower than log n. So I tried to clarify again and said, that's definitely true for larger values. But at smaller values, it might not be true. It's possible the effects of things like caching, branch prediction. And he cut me off again. This time he kind of snapped and said that it sounds like I don't understand big O at all. This felt a little off the rails by now. And unfortunately, that's how the interview ended. We were out of time and the next interviewer was knocking on the door. So I didn't feel great about that interview. Ended up still getting an offer and I was at Google for many years and did many interviews myself, so it worked out fine. Definitely a low light of the process though. The subtlety here is that with, uh, let's say, order n versus log n, as an example, order log n will definitely be faster, eventually, as n approaches infinity. Look at the definition again f at x is order g at x if there exists a positive constant m and a real number x sub 0 such that f at x is less than or equal to m times g at x for x greater than or equal to x sub 0. And that's the important part, for some x sub 0, not every single value. 
So if the original equations were something more like 0.001n versus 1000 log n, let's just be contrived here, that's order n versus order log n. But if you graph those, you'll notice, yes, of course, eventually log n will be better. But this whole area here, this is where the asymptotically worse algorithm outperformed the supposedly faster one. In a game, we're not usually concerned with infinity. In fact, we may know for absolute certain that there's at most a thousand entities, or 50,000 particles, or whatever. So in those cases where we know the domain well, big O doesn't necessarily tell us the whole story. Hope you found this useful, subscribe and comment, and of course, if I got anything wrong, let me know, politely. See you next time. Cheers.